Okay, let me share my screen now. Excellent, thank you. Cheers. Share and is it visible to everybody? Yeah, perfectly visible. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. Well, well, first of all, thank you guys for the opportunity and yeah, to take the stage at Wonderland AI and then talk a little bit about how we use deep learning for object detection within Vodafone Zigo. So it's not uh, something that you see like every day, like telcos going around uh, talking about deep learning and also like using state of the art, mo of the art models to actually uh, cut costs and also like improve the way that our customers uh, interact with our products. So as we are not Facebook nor Google, but still we try to do something cool with, uh, with what we can find uh, in, the, in the industry and also of course coming from the academia. Uh, so in that sense, <clears throat> we move on to a nice agenda in terms of uh, what we do within Vodafone Diego. So that's my uh, sales pitch. Although I don't know if anyone in the audience actually lives in the Netherlands, but anyways, uh, just a bit about the company, uh, the business case itself, uh, how we actually collected, cleaned and labeled our data set. So there was uh, quite some uh, struggles and challenges there. Uh, some of the data augmentation that we applied to the data set that we have, uh, the modeling uh, that we, like the modeling technique, yeah, for object detection, uh, you might know what's out there, but then what we picked and why we picked the certain things. Uh, and then it comes to a point where we actually talk more about the software engineering part of the work, uh, because what we try to achieve is to have a end-to-end -end, a platform where we work towards the inception of a project, modeling techniques, but also like a fully automated uh, CI CD pipeline, like in the software engineering world, where we can just like deploy our products uh, to our end customers. And of course, it's not only about training, but as you can see there also how the inference is actually done. Without any further ado, we get started. Just a bit of history and uh, why I think it's important. Uh, when you look at the milestones there, so from when the first coaxial cable was actually put through uh, like uh, the Atlantic, like back in 1858, seems like long time ago, of course, uh, almost 200 years. But then from there to when we actually had the first like 16 kilometers of cable from New York, to Philadelphia, making possible for 240 like simultaneously telephone calls. It's like you can think about well, 240 only, but okay, that was almost like 100 years after the first uh, transatlantic cable. So it took quite some time to achieve that, that point <clears throat> there in history. But then when you look at how the progress, uh, progress started to be made, uh, towards uh, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, which is like way longer like, uh, <clears throat> than what was done in New York and Philadelphia. And also getting to from uh, 260, 260 simultaneous telephone calls, uh, three times, uh, oh, sorry, uh, 1260 simultaneous. So then, which is uh, like uh, one and a half time more than uh, what happened, like uh, just like 30 years before that, but uh, all the way to, for example, uh, last year, like 2019, when Zigo deployed here in the Netherlands a one gigabit uh, network in the country to cover like a 93%, if I'm not mistaken, of the country using mostly uh, <clears throat> uh, optical fiber and coaxial cables. So then in our setup, what we have is we have a distributed network of, uh, of fiber throughout the country and only the last like 3%, which is actually from some street cabinets uh, on the streets to the homes of our customers, we have coaxial cables. But then this still helps us to actually deliver the promise of having one gigabit uh, network connection inside the homes uh, cable. So it's, of course, if we just move to a wireless connection, we know that uh, there will be some drop in the speed, but still it, uh, it brought a brand new product to, to the whole country and actually up to now, it's the only company that offers a such speed. Uh, and as you can see, in the, so that's the map of the Netherlands, obviously, uh, with our coverage right now, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not a monopoly, but it gets close to it. <laughs> uh, then, okay, so we have seen like how it actually, well, 
terms of a little bit of the technology and the history about like coax cables and the cables that we use to connect our customers to our services. But how can we actually get to a business case where uh, we can make some use of computer vision to help our customers? If you ask me like, well, can AI help somewhere else in the company? Of course it can, because we have like a lot of data in terms of like time series from like modern statistics, but also like a free text from a chat that our uh, employees, uh, the call center agents have with our customers. And then looking from a computer vision perspective, perspective, there's not much there, unless we try to be like very innovative and creative with, <clears throat> with what we can actually do for our customers. So for instance, just to explain a little bit the business case, inside uh, every home, there is a, uh, the in-home uh, connection uh, to the services. It's a socket on the wall where the, the customer will connect the modem and the set-top box. Pretty simple, then that's it. But then there is a problem with it. As, we, as technology evolves, uh, when we move the speed from uh, one coaxial cable type to another, so the frequency also changes and the frequency increases. And it means that we need to get like a new in-home uh, connection or socket for the customers. So the customer doesn't know what they have. And then what they do is they go to the website, they buy a product. And then two weeks after that, they receive a box and they have all the instructions to do the installation themselves. And then that's when the problem might happen. And, and it does happen in 26% of the cases. So we now have about like a thousand shipments per day. And then in about 260 of those shipments, everything goes wrong because when the customer opens uh, the box, uh, the product that they have bought, uh, the modem it comes with, it's not compliant with the socket that they have on the wall. So there's nothing they can do. They cannot connect it. It's just not going to work. So next step is the customer calls our call center. The call center will just say, sorry, but we cannot do anything. It just, it's not compatible. And then they're going to schedule like a visit with one of our technicians to go there and then do the, the installation, replacing the components that are not compat compatible. What's the issue with that? Well, the issue is that it might take two weeks to get the box at home. And uh, yeah, on average, yeah, between somewhere between one and a half to two weeks uh, to actually have the technician coming over to do the installation. That's why, because there's a huge planning place, a uh, planning place that the technicians are all busy doing some other things. And then the customer might end up in a worst case scenario, waiting like four weeks to get their internet and TV connection working. So that's why this is the second most reason for churn. So at this point, most of the customers will say, you know what, goodbye. I don't want this anymore. And then they call the competitor and say, please don't cancel my contract. I'm staying with you guys. So it's really, it's really bad. How can we actually fix it with computer vision? So uh, you might have noticed that, well, there is something on the wall. There's a socket there that we can identify. So that's a very good case for, for computer vision. And that's what we actually did. So we developed a model. What we developed, like we uh, fine-tuned a YOLO V3 model to actually do the object detection for us uh, <clears throat> based on the data set that we collected. So the idea is very simple. The customer buys a product, good. After that, the customer will then just say, hey, uh, oh, the customer will get like an SMS with a link, or oh, you just bought this product, could you be, please uh, go to this website and then check what you have on your uh, fuse box. So they open the fuse box, they take a picture. If it's all fine, good. They don't have to do anything anymore. However, if we have like uh, issues with it, then we're gonna just let the customer know, look, this is not compatible. Please plan a visit from one of our technicians. And then from the point that they purchase, they are already able to actually plan that visit, meaning that once the box arrived within two weeks or so, the technician will also come along to finish all the installation and replace whatever component that it's not compatible. So customer is happy. Uh, the product, it's gonna work just fine from the start. And then uh, we gonna, and we reduce also like a call uh, because the call, uh, to the call center also costs uh, quite some money. So then that call, it's actually not happening. So, okay, we've been through the a little bit of history. We understood the case. We found like a very nice business case where we can apply computer vision. 
But of course, uh, that doesn't make the whole thing. We also need some data, uh, some images, pictures from those components that we want to identify. So to, to do that, we went through like collecting uh, about like 47,000 images. That was done by like a, like a colleague of mine. He started in the project and then he had the idea to, to develop like a, an a mobile application and give to the technician. Then <clears throat> we get to, to this, that's the collecting app, just showing how it works. It was developed by a third party, but like pretty easy. Uh, the technician can say like, okay, that's the kind of uh, AOP that, uh, so the AOP is the socket on the wall. That's what the customer has. And then they take the picture. And also like if there is a splitter on top of the AOP, which is actually a component that splits the, the, the data coming from the network, from the video data and the, actually the network, uh, like the network packets that have to be connected to the modem. Uh, <clears throat> so then, by doing this, by selecting what the customer has, uh, the image that was, the pictures that were taken by the technicians would end up in a certain bucket. So it's kind of a pre-labeled bucket on S3, on AWS. So that helped us to actually say, uh, in this campaign, we're gonna label like just certain components and then just taking all those images and moving on to the collection, to the labeling part. But that, of course, as I mentioned, before we actually label it, we have to see how the data looked like. So what happened there is that the application was taking the pictures automatically. It just requ required the technicians to kind of move the cell phone a little bit. So then we could capture like different angles from, from, uh, from the, the object that we wanted to identify. But then this moving part that the technicians had to make actually created the, uh, an issue for us because it added like uh, some blur to the images if they were like moving too fast or distortions also to the image. And sometimes the image uh, were like uh, in one session, uh, the phone would take like 50 images. So then the images were like almost the same. And that's because the, the technician was not like moving at all. And that created like some problems in our data set. And then in order to clean it, we applied some uh, like just plain old uh, uh, computer vision techniques using OpenCV. For instance, uh, the Laplacian kernel to filter uh, images that are considered blue based on a certain score. So then we looked at images that we consider like to be good. We took a threshold and then we just automated the process of removing images that were like uh, blur, as we can see like in these uh, examples on the on the right. So at the end, we removed about uh, 10,000 images that were like considered like very bad for us to be <clears throat> trained with. And then after that, we said, okay, from these uh, three, uh, uh, 37,000 images, what can we do? But yeah, labeling 37,000 images, it takes uh, a toll on us because, well, it requires a lot of time. Uh, we did some labeling ourselves, but then for instance, we started with Microsoft VOTT in a proof of concept way. So we labeled about 600 images. And then you might say, well, that's not a lot. No, that's not. So the model was of course overfitting. But because the components we have, they're like very similar to each other. Like it's everything is squared with some holes and the differences uh, are more related to where a certain screw is placed or, or like uh, on the edge of the, of the boxes uh, of those uh, sockets. So those 600 images we initially labeled with Microsoft VOTT, uh, they actually helped us to, to get through the, to get through the proof of concept phase, let's say. Uh, and of course it also worked because we did add some, uh, some augmentation and we added, we transferred like all the weights from the darknet uh, 53 network, which I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute or so. Uh, so Microsoft VOTT is the image on the, in the middle there on the right side. And when we said, okay, now we have to actually scale it up a little bit because now we're gonna get help from, uh, from technicians to actually do the labeling for us. So, and my Microsoft VOTT just didn't scale on Amazon because it's more like, uh, like Azure centered. It doesn't have a connector for Amazon. So we moved to AWS Ground Truth to, for the labeling. So AWS, AWS uh, Ground Truth helped us because it is like a multi, like multi user. So we could create just user accounts, users that were already connected to our platform, and then they could just do the labeling for us. 
Uh, <clears throat> and then we end up with about like uh, 80,000 labeled images, like before augmentation, just like, uh, as you can see in the example there, like just the bounding boxes around the, the socket on the wall, uh, the, the outlet, uh, and also the splitter. But then, yeah, unexpected, we also have some problems with, uh, with ground truth. And then uh, ground truth actually had some issues concerning like uh, uh, consolidation. So the idea of consolidation that they have is that you create a task uh, and then that task will have uh, like uh, several images to be labeled, but you expect that one image will be visited by a certain amount of people. So then what they do, what we did actually, so we said that each image has to be labeled by three different users. And by doing so, we tried to actually make sure that uh, the, the bounding box would be like as best as possible in terms of location. And that's because uh, Microsoft, or oh, sorry, AWS will just do a IOU, take the IOU, like the intersection over the union of those three bounding boxes and take the best of it like averaging them. Uh, and another thing it would do is like, if two people labeled the image as, uh, for instance, a cat and someone labeled it as a dog, so then it would take the cat as the correct label. But in practice, it didn't work. So we actually end up with, uh, with quite some, uh, like a couple of thousand images that were like just, well, the data set was corrupted. Uh, like a, the, like a, one image had like several labels and it didn't help a lot. And because of that, we decided to move to OpenCV, CVAT, so CVAT, which was open sourced last year by Intel. Uh, and it's like a very powerful tool. It's, uh, it's the one on the top of the image, uh, on, the, on the top, uh, right top. Uh, and uh, it has uh, like some standardized exports and imports, which for instance, AWS Ground Truth doesn't have. So meaning we had to write our own parser from that for that one, uh, and uh, CVAT works with uh, uh, TF records. It works with a YOLO uh, dataset format with Pascal VOC uh, with uh, Microsoft Coco. So it's pretty important to have those things in place. It also has like semi uh, automatic labeling, uh, and you can even like have like a custom model uh, uh, uploaded to the tool where you can use that custom model as an active learning uh, 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 option to also like automatically label uh, your images. And it's multi-tenant ready. You can also like deploy it in the cloud. So that's the, if you ask me, so that should be the way to go. Okay, I think I've talked a lot about the, the whole, just checking the time, about the whole uh, labeling part. Yeah, I think you all know and might agree that it's the most difficult part when you get the data. So the data has to be good, but you also need good label, uh, labels when you work with uh, supervised uh, problems. Uh, but then after that, so we didn't have like enough images to be able to recognize like lots of, uh, of AOPs because in total we had 34 labels. So then having 34 labels, like uh, the distribution was not, not really uh, uh, uniform. So we had like a a couple of components with like a thousands of images. And then we also have like lots of components with something even like below a hundred images, uh, like a hundred labels. And that didn't help that much. So that actually changed a little bit the, the project, the focus. And then we just said, well, we're gonna focus on one product now. And then, which is, uh, for instance, I mentioned the, the gigabit. So, but customers buying other products, they cannot, cannot really check if their AOP is good enough or not. So that's something that we are like working now, uh, working on now to actually improve the whole thing. But then still, because we didn't have enough, so we needed to augment the data. So try to, so I took this idea like a, less is more. So then just turn this, this 8,000 images in, in, in something more. And then we went on on just applying some uh, TensorFlow native functions to, to change like brightness, saturation, hue and contrast on the images. And then using a, <clears throat> an external library for the, the augmentation in terms of rotations. And the thing is, uh, we're not, it's not the easy, uh, an easy augmentation part to rotate the image because when you have classification, a classification problem, if you just have an image and if you say, well, there is a cat in this image, you don't know what the cat is, but there's a cat there. So then you just rotate the whole image because the label remains the same. It's just like a, a categorical label. But then in this problem here, 
uh, when you rotate the image, you also have to rotate the, the labels and the labels are like the bounding boxes based on the axis of that have been rotated. So for that, we use the image augmentation library, which is also publicly available to add those random rotations to our images and then hence improve a little bit the way that the model would behave. And from there, okay, so we've got uh, the data set, we labeled it, we augmented it, fine, but now comes a time that we actually have to, to train it, right? So then here in terms of training, uh, which model to use and how to do it. So of course we picked the model with it way before we actually had the data set uh, labeled. And, and why did we do this? Uh, so YOLO is uh, pretty well known and it's one of the state-of-the-art uh, state of the art models for uh, object detection. Uh, it's faster and for us faster was actually better. So it's not as accurate as uh, the fa fast uh, RCNN for instance, but for us, what we wanted to do with YOLO was to make sure that it would work within a mobile application. So uh, it's not what we have right now. Uh, it's more because of, uh, well, decisions that we made throughout the, 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 the process of developing the, the whole project. But what we want to do is actually to have our computer vision models uh, deployed with uh, TensorFlow uh, light in the mobile phones, hence, uh, decrease in all the latency that we are now have because we use a service in the cloud for the customers to connect to. And it also means that if we have the model actually deployed in the phone, uh, it reduces the cost of keeping it in the cloud. Because of course, if you have some things running in the cloud, it's going to just cost you money. And we want to get rid of those costs as well. So we went for YOLO V3 for this. Uh, as I mentioned, like the trade-off between accuracy and speed, uh, we initialized the weights of the, of the network uh, using the Darknet 53. So then we, the, the transfer learning part we did was more in terms of uh, initializing the weights with uh, pre-trained weights, not actually uh, freezing a certain, uh, uh, a certain layer of the network. And, uh, and it helped us all the way from training with this, like just the small data set of uh, six, 600 images, as I mentioned, to the, the bigger data set with like 8K or like a 32K when it was actually augmented, like approximately 32K. So the way that, why is YOLO like a, so fast compared to some other models? So the thing that's at inference time, what the YOLO does is uh, it's gonna just for a certain number of bounding boxes that you predefine, so the default is 100, it's gonna just apply those 100 bounding boxes like randomly on top of the, on top of the of the image, and then it oh, during training, sorry, and then what does is uh, it apply it applies a regression to actually find uh, based on the information that was given the labels, find the the best bounding box, uh, predict the best bounding box, uh, those four points uh, to find the image, and then it so you get the output, the class and the bounding box for that given class, and then you just use it to plot. Uh, the, the rectangle or square on the image that has been found. So where it thinks that it found it. Uh, and during inference, it just applies the same thing with a non-max suppression. So because it might actually have several bounding boxes. Huh? For us, for instance, what we do, we pick 10. So then our image will, uh, uh, so the model during inference time, it's gonna just like regress and plot like, a, and find like a 10 uh, bounding boxes. The non-max no -max suppression will get the best of those 10. And then that's where the, our object will be. Uh, but then, as I said, so we tried to make sure that everything works end to end. So we went from collecting. So this was like one team of three people doing the whole thing in terms of uh, collecting the data, uh, managing the labeling. So we did a labeling of about like a 2000 images, but then the rest was done by the technicians. And then, uh, training the model, but also of course, making sure that the training is automated, that we have like a proper structure in place, huh? a proper like organization structure within our repositories and also making sure that the inference uh, part will be automated. So for the training and inference automation, so for instance, enabling the CICD, we really uh, uh, modularized the whole, the whole thing. So we do not have this one monolith uh, repository with everything in it, like a training code, inference code, web service code. Now, uh, what we have is one project that does the automation of the labeling 
part. Uh, this is all the names are pretty cool. Huh? You might, if you're not a Marvel fan, uh, you won't see it. But if you are just a little bit, you will recognize that all the names of the projects are like Marvel related. So that's how much I like it. So Warlock is where we actually do all the automation for the inference part. So everything is automated with uh, AWS uh, CDK, uh, the, the Cloud Formation uh, uh, Development Kit. Uh, we have Forge, where actually we have the model definition. So, and why we have it uh, like separate, uh, because the model definition it use, is used for both training, you need the architecture there, but also for inference. So then we load the model based on Forge. So it's more like our library. All the augmentation part is also in Forge, so everything is really separate. If we need to change something related to augmentation, we don't have to like change anything else. It also actually decreases the chance of uh, adding bugs to some code that uh, we don't want to touch, right? Uh, so we have the training automation is done with Storm, so then it's separate from inference because like uh, training is done on the GPU on a Tesla T T100 and uh, and the uh, the inference is done on just like a normal, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like a, it's a couple of the T2 micro uh, instances uh, with a load balance in front of them. And then we have the whole training model, which is everything runs on top of Docker. So the training module is uh, Cyclops there. So it just runs the training. So when we deploy it to AWS on a, GPU instance, so then it just fakes a Docker image from uh, from AWS ECR, the Elastic Container Registry, runs the container in the GPU, starts the training, and will dump it afterwards on S3. And the inference is also like Dockerized, and it's a separate model uh, module. So, and then to understand how it all comes together, so for instance, at least if we look at the training from a training perspective, so <clears throat> when we do the deployment. Uh, so everything is uh, like all those pieces are put together from a very nice uh, Terraform. So for training uh, automation, we use Terraform. For inference, we use uh, we use uh, AWS CDK. So then it's like picking up a contain a, a Docker image from ECR, running it within the GPU after the training is done. So then we have some monitoring that is done uh, on each epoch uh, to follow up on like on the validation laws if it still goes down for a certain period of time. If, if uh, it's not going down, we change uh, the learning rate as well. There's also like a monitor for that uh, to, to a certain point in time where, okay, we reach a plateau. It doesn't make sense to keep trying it because the, the loss during the training just keeps going fine. But the validation loss uh, for Epoch, it might at some point in time just stop uh, going down. And then that's when we have like, a, a, like an overfit from the training side only. So then we just stop it and we dump the model on an S3 bucket, which then from there, you see, so that's another colleague. So he got his model and he couldn't install it. But then from there, what happens is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so after this is all in place, we just pick up that model in another container and then it's running for the customers. I will just do a quick demo for you guys. Okay, two minutes remaining, but there's two quick questions afterwards. Do you have much left, Vilder? No, no, it's just a uh, very... Yeah, uh, quick, okay, great. Just so we can make sure to get the questions in as well. Now. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then that's more or less the service that we have uh, developed uh, that the customers can actually look at it from their From the mobile phone, take a picture and then uh, and then see how it actually works. Oh, it's taking my two minutes. Yeah. Well, while that's loading, I'll ask the question and you can think of the yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, anonymous attendee would like to ask uh, one interesting question, not necessarily related. Is it possible to teach machine machine ethics, empathy, or compassion? Okay, let's park that for a moment. That could be a bit of a philosophical one. The other one is, um, what do you think how inference will look in five to six years from now? Are we going to see, uh, have latency close to zero? Okay, uh, okay, like picking on the first one, uh, interesting question, right? Yeah, possible to teach machines ethics, empathy, or compassion? Well, that's, yeah, pretty much philosophical. Uh, well, from a, 
if you look at it from a practical point of view, like the way we teach machines now to actually understand images, uh, some people compare it as, uh, to the way you teach a, a child to understand, to know what a cat is or dog is, but then that's still just based on, uh, <clears throat> based on just like a pixels in an image. So then it's, it's a very straightforward. Uh, when you look at things like uh, compassion and, uh, and empathy, uh, so it would take like uh, uh, way, way more like robust system to actually look at the causal uh, uh, inference of, of things. Uh, for instance, if, if someone performs an action against someone else or against something, and so how the person that received that action actually reacted and, and how the person that was delivering the action reacted and then try to infer on top of it. So I don't really see it happening in, in the next 50 years, to be honest, because uh, although there's a lot of research on top of uh, causal uh, machine learning, but it's more related to practical actions. And when you talk about empathy and compassion, it takes like actually people's emotions and reactions and, and like uh, gestures, everything, you know? And even mm -hmm. when they weigh the talk back to someone, if it's not like a physical reaction, but just like a, if they speak something. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Was there another question or that was it? There was just the latency one, but I think you partially answered that. Uh, will we have a latency close to zero in five to six years? Yeah, I think like AI on the edge uh, might bring us there because as long as we still depend on services uh, running on some data center on the cloud, latency will be in place. So I think AI on the edge might bring this latency close to zero. Okay, very good and nicely put. And nicely on time actually, well done. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Elder, I want to say thank you very much um, for your very concise, compact presentation and the questions also.